Okay, welcome everybody. Um, my name is Christy Morley and I am the senior naturalist here at Wissahickon Trails. Um, and we're gonna talk tonight about wildlife of the Wissahickon. Uh, for those who joined after my first round of announcements, um, please be sure to keep your microphones muted for the, the conversation today. There's a lot of people online and there's just a lot of feedback if people unmute. So we're gonna use the chat box for questions. Um, so feel free as I'm going along to type your questions in there and I will stop several times throughout the presentation and um, see what people have asked questions about and um, you know, have an opportunity for you to uh, add questions uh, as we go along. So uh, please feel free to use the chat box for those purposes. And um, the, we are recording this, so the recording will be available online um, within a week. Usually we get it up within a couple of days, so um, you can take a look at it there. And I'm gonna say right now also, Mike, for some reason it's either Zoom or my computer. I have a little bit of a lag when I'm trying to switch slides. So uh, bear with me as we get through this. Okay, um, so real quick, I just wanna talk about um, what our outline for tonight is. Um, and, we're gonna kind of divide this into sort of three parts. Um, the first part is gonna be a little bit about um, how do we know what's out there in terms of wildlife in the Wissahickon Valley watershed. And then we're gonna talk about some of the keystone species in the watershed and we'll talk about what a keystone species is. And then we're gonna talk um, to wrap up the night a little bit about how you can be a wildlife monitor um, if you would like to. So for those who are not familiar with us, I know I saw a lot of new names that I didn't recognize on the uh, sign-up sheet. Um, so we are an envir environmental nonprofit based in Ambler, Pennsylvania. We are a little over 60 years old um, and we're founded to protect and the land and water of the Wissahickon Creek in uh, largely Montgomery County. Um, we have protected about 1300 acres of land from development and we currently manage 12 nature preserves and about 24 miles of trails. Um, we are a nonprofit organization and we do very much rely on supporter assistance to continue our mission. And so I would encourage you if you are not already a supporter of us, and I know a number of you on tonight are because I recognize your name. So my personal thank you for being a supporter of our organization. Um, if you're not, I encourage you to go take a look at our website and see a little bit more in detail some of the work that we do and hopefully decide to become a supporter of us as well. We would really appreciate that. And it really does help us to uh, continue our mission of protecting the land and the water of the Wissahickon Valley. So when we talk about wildlife of the Wissahickon, we have to have some way of knowing what's out there. So how do we know what's out there? Um, and for us, this is largely driven by a number of site inventories and surveys that were done between 2013 and 2016. And the reason why we did this as an organization was because we were working, we, and we still are working to create management plans for all of the 12 preserves that we manage so that we can understand how to improve that habitat for the creatures that are there. And in order to do that, we have to know what's there to begin with. So we were able to hire a variety of experts to come out and do these surveys. And I'm not really gonna spend a lot of time talking about the specifics of the surveys because for each thing, they're a little bit different and some are very detailed um, in the way that this information is collected. But just know that this is kind of how we created our baseline of understanding of what was out there on our preserves and using our preserves. And so we looked at trees, plants, and shrubs. We looked at um, herps, which we're gonna talk about what that are. are. We looked at entomolog ent entomological bugs, insects, uh, mammals, fish, and then birds. Um, and the birds was actually more of um, some historical data so that birders in 
the watershed had collected over the years. Um, and then also looking at doing um, staff run breeding bird surveys. And we do also do migration and wintering surveys. And so the birds are really an ongoing kind of a thing. Um, everything else was kind of a one-time thing um, by the experts that came out and helped us. But as you'll see when we get to the third part of the presentation, uh, we are trying to continue some of this work and there are ways that you can get involved to continue to help us monitor these kinds of things and continue to learn about the species that are using our preserves. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the results of each survey um, for the, the various uh, organisms that we were looking at. So when we were doing um, plants, trees, and shrubs, um, they found a total of 574 species on our preserves, um, about 66% native and about 34% introduced. Um, overall, the, the habitat itself is not great um, in a lot of respects. It's largely impacted by, uh, at one point, most of it was clear cut for agriculture. And so it's second or third growth forest. It's not really old growth forest, although there are a few areas that are older uh, because they were never cut or cut in very limited fashion. Um, but by and large, we're looking at a relatively young forest in, in our area. Um, there are a lot of invasive species and uh, there's a lot of deer and they are significantly impacting um, the habitat, particularly as it relates to trees and shrubs and plants. Um, we also live in a very fragmented landscape. So that impacts um, how wildlife use our preserves um, and how they are able to get from one preserve to another. And that's why we're also trying to um, encourage homeowners to plant native as much as possible and encourage their neighbors to plant native as much as possible. And the more that we get people to do that, the more that we connect those fragments of usable landscape and we make corridors that wildlife can use um, to get from a bigger area of habitat to another bigger area of habitat. Uh, and that really helps overall um, in protecting the land for uh, the creatures that are out there. And the other thing, again, because it's habitat, uh, fragmented habitat, we have a lot of edges. Um, so you can imagine if you have, you know, one big area that's, I don't know, say 50 acres, and then you have an edge all the way around that 50 acres. But if you break that 50 acres into a whole bunch of little segments that are only, you know, 10 acres, a piece or so, and there's a, an, a developed land in the middle, you end up with so many more edges. Um, and again, that edge habitat impacts the kinds of creatures that will use um, the area that they're in. So um, you can see there just a table, um, you know, most of our trees are, are native, um, about 26 species were introduced, but a total of 79 species of trees, um, shrubs, um, again, it's shrubs, it's about split 50-50, native versus introduced. Um, a lot of the perennial herbs that we have out there, so flowers and things like that and grasses, um, there are a lot of native species out there um, and we continue to add to that moving forward. Some of the key uh, invasive species that exist out there are things like Norway maples, calorie or Bradford pears, multiflora rose, Chinese privet, Japanese stilt grass, um, a lot of things that have been planted over the years for um, uh, by homeowners and in nursery trades to landscape schools and malls areas and parking lot edges and those kinds of things. And um, a lot of them didn't stay where they were put and now they're sort of taking over some of the, the natural areas. Um, and so we continue to work um, through our management plans to try to identify highly um, impacted areas of invasive species and work to remove them and replace them with native species. Um, for mammals, uh, we actually had a variety uh, that we encountered, um, about 20 species total, um, plus bats, which the bats themselves weren't actually um, part of this survey of mammals, uh, but they do fall into this category. So 
um, probably about 20, 25 species in total. There were a few that were missed um, that were kind of expected, like the survey didn't actually ever see a possum or groundhog. Um, and we would expect to see them. And in fact, we have seen them in other contexts beyond the actual survey that was done. So we know they're out there. Um, we actually saw less non-natives than expected given the urban environment. So Norway rats and um, domestic cats, feral cats and things like that. Well, uh, there are some out there. The, the numbers that were found were actually much less than expected. So a lot of the things that you would kind of expect to see, um, and maybe you have already encountered either in your own yard or in a walk on one of our preserves or a neighboring area, um, but things like red fox, skunks, um, obviously squirrels and chipmunks, uh, groundhogs, yes, cottontail uh, rabbits, white deer, white-tailed deer, excuse me. Um, but there were a few that were somewhat surprising. Um, you may or may not know that we actually do sometimes have beaver that show up along the creek. Um, they are often relocated <laughs> to another more suitable habitat uh, by the Game Commission, mostly because the area that they set up shop, if we really let them stay there and cut down trees and build a dam, they would end up flooding um, a large number of yards and possibly even houses that are situated relatively close to the creek. Um, so they're not really um, ideal for this environment, uh, given the level of urbanization that we have right along some areas of the creek. But they are out there and sometimes you can see them. Um, the other thing that was of particular note was uh, flying squirrels, which you may not know are actually in the area. Um, this second picture in down here at the bottom uh, from, from the, uh, the left is a flying squirrel. Um, these guys don't actually fly. They more glide from tree to tree. They've got an extra flap of skin that connects their, fore, their forelegs to their hind legs, and they can use that to glide from tree to tree. They can't actually flap like a bird and fly. Um, they are out there, um, mostly found at our Briar Hill Preserve, but they're probably in other places as well. And just a note about them, they are very nocturnal, so they're really hard to see unless you're out there at night, um, which is hard to do for a lot of people. And um, so, again, you might have the opportunity to see one um, if you're out on the preserves at night or in this area in general. Um, there's probably a lot more flying squirrels out there than we realize. We just don't see them because they come out when we're all asleep. Um, one really good way to try to see them is um, if you have bird feeders in your yard, if there's any way that you can set up a camera on your feeders, uh, especially overnight. Um, often if there's flying squirrels in the area, they will come to bird feeders, especially when there's um, nuts or um, sunflower seeds in there. They'll come and eat those things. So just like the gray squirrels do during the day, the flying squirrels may visit at night. But unless you have a camera set up, you may not see that. Um, so something to think about if you've got a, a, a feeder out that you might want to uh, try that and see if you can see a flying squirrel. Um, and it's especially true if you live in a neighborhood that's got big old trees, um, there's probably flying squirrels around. Also of note was um, another, uh, mammal that we saw was um, the American mink. And this was a little bit surprising, although not entirely. Um, somewhat expected to be there, but we weren't really sure they were, is really what it comes down to. And a mink, this um, is this tiny little one down here, uh, second in from the right, uh, all dark with this little white patch under its chin. Um, these guys are semi-aquatic, so they're never very far away from water. And um, they, they can climb trees, they hop and run pretty quickly. And um, they're not very common, um, but we are actually starting to get more and more reports of them. And I don't know if it's just people paying attention more 
or their numbers are actually somewhat increasing. Um, and that might be something that we might want to go back and try to do a little bit more work on understanding um, how the mink specifically and how they're using the creek and exactly where they are. Um, but they've been seen in a variety of locations up and down the creek. Um, I'm sitting in our office at Four Mills right now, and they've been seen in the creek um, along here um, from several different locations in this preserve and also further up the Green Ribbon Trail um, towards the headwaters, they, they're also up there. So um, they're pretty generalist kind of species. They eat rodents and fish. Um, they'll go after birds sometimes if they can, bird eggs for uh, ground nesting species. Like I said, they can also climb trees, um, crayfish. They'll pretty much eat anything they can find. Um, they're very similar to weasels. And so um, you might actually see a weasel. We did not find a, a weasel in our mammal study, but they are expected and we've had reports of them. And sometimes it's hard to know if people are reporting a mink or a weasel and calling them one or the other things and not being sure of the identification. So I'm gonna give you guys a tip um, to help you tell them apart. The weasel is over here on the very left-hand side and the weasels are all white or kind of cream colored underneath um, and typically usually brown on top where the minks are all dark. They might have this little white patch under their chin or under a little bit of white on their chest, but their belly and their underside is all dark just like the, their back is. Um, and so even if you only get a quick glance, if you know that one's white on the bottom and one's not, sometimes you can be able to know, yes, I saw a mink or I saw a weasel. Um, and please feel free if you see them, email me and let me know where you saw them. And it, all the more if you can get pictures of them, that would be great um, because there are things that go by really fast a lot of times and, and they're hard to, um, to see you know, uh, regularly. So I would love to have reports of those. Um, feel free to drop me an email if you happen to come across them um, on the trail. Uh, the herpetological study looked at amphibians and reptiles, and just a refresher, amphibians are really our frogs, toads, and salamanders, and they all generally need both land and water to complete their entire life cycle. Most of them lay their eggs in water, they hatch into tadpoles or aquatic larvae, and then those larvae live in the water until they metamorphose into an adult. Uh, reptiles are um, snakes and turtles, they actually lay their eggs on land. Um, some snakes actually do live in the water, like our northern water snakes, but they do lay their eggs on land. Um, some snakes even have live births, um, and then they occupy a wide variety of habitats. Uh, snapping turtles are often found in the water, but they come out to lay their eggs um, in a hole that they dig uh, far away from the creek, uh, and then they'll go back and, and stay in the water. So we, again, just like the mammals survey, um, we found a lot of things that we expected to find. Um, you can see the list there, and I'm not gonna go through all of these species because you can see it's a rather long list um, once you start getting to this point of the different turtles that were found, all of the snakes, uh, the different salamander species, and then the frogs and toads. Um, there were some, some expected species that were missing. Um, like wood frog, which is actually down here on the left hand side. This is a wood frog picture. And the second frog um, in the middle over here is a spring peeper. And neither one of those showed up in the surveys. And we know from other surveys that we've done, um, there are peepers out there that, so the limitations of the surveys, um, these kinds of species are, are often hidden. Um, under rocks, under logs, on, um, very camouflaged on trees and, and leaves, so they can be really hard to find. Uh, their movements away from areas are, or to areas are very, very seasonal, um, and they're generally related to breeding or migration times, and they're also very temperature and moisture dependent. So the wood frogs, for example, are what we consider to be explosive breeders, now, I know that sounds really funny, but it just means their breeding time is a very, very short period. And it's really determined at the end of the winter and into early spring when things are just warm enough for them to come out of their 
hibernation state and move to um, vernal pools or seasonal pools that are in the woods where they mate and lay their eggs. And so that can happen over the course of like a week, maybe two weeks, if the conditions are right or there's enough wood frogs out there and they will spend that time in that week or two calling very, very um, loudly and incessantly. And then once those breeding season, that breeding season is over, they stop calling completely and they're really hard to find. So if the surveyors weren't out there at that absolute specific time, um, they would have missed them. And so unfortunately, that's a limitation dealing with a lot of these kinds of species um, in terms of the surveys. But we do know that the spring peepers are out there. So there's a really good chance that there are wood frogs out there, um, which would be a really good thing to have. They are reliant specifically on these seasonal pools in the woods. And we have a lot of those seasonal pools. So this is something that we continue to monitor and look for uh, and see if we can confirm their presence. Um, but the other thing that this showed us was um, there's also some good opportunity here for habitat management. So we could look to install more vernal pools, for example, more seasonal areas for um, salamanders and um, things like the wood frogs and the spring peepers to come and breed. Um, a lot of these species rely on um, forest understory, so smaller trees and shrubs um, underneath the forest canopy to climb up on and call from. And because of the deer that I talked about in the beginning and eating so many things, um, we don't have a lot of understory in areas. So that's going to limit the appearance of some of these things like wood frogs or peepers or some of the other um, frogs specifically. Um, and then we can create brush and rock piles as well. Um, and that creates habitat for things like some of the snakes and um, some of the turtles uh, will use um, brush and rock piles for hibernation areas or breeding areas. And so um, making those things part of our management plan, we can hope to increase um, the presence of some of these species. So uh, the entomological survey or insects, um, this, <laughs> we found 995 species of insects. <laughs> so uh, just because of the sheer number uh, that we taught, that we found and the sheer diversity of the things that fall that are categorized as insects, um, it's really, really difficult for me to summarize these findings in any way that's gonna make sense. So what I've done here is shown um, sort of the, the major orders of insects that we have in the watershed and the percentage of the species that we found that fall under those. So the largest one that we found is this big yellow block here at the bottom. Almost half of everything that we found was either a butterfly or a moth. Um, but even within that 45% there, um, only 13% of that was actually butterflies. The rest is all moths. And again, kind of like the flying squirrels, there are a lot of moths out there, um, but because they're very nocturnal and the best ones come out at two o'clock in the morning, literally, um, we very rarely see them. And so that is a significant opportunity for um, all of us to learn a little bit more about some of those um, night insects and night creatures in general. Um, I'm going to be doing a um, program on moths later in July. I think it's July. July, I'm pretty sure. Um, so keep an eye out for that um, because I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about uh, their sort of life history right now. Um, but I will talk about how you can observe moths um, in your own backyard uh, at that presentation. So I hope you can join us then. Um, Beetles is this big gray category here. That was the next highest one. Um, and then this green over here uh, is flies, mosquitoes, and midges. They're kind of all grouped together. And then we were at ants, wasps, wasps and bees is this orange one. Uh, dragonflies and damselflies at 6%, 7%. Uh, true bugs which I know sounds funny because we think of all of these as bugs, but there is actually a category of true bugs. Uh, this uh, bug down here in the lower right-hand corner is a uh, leaf-footed bug, uh, and this actually is in the true bug category. 
um, as compared to this lightning bug here, which is actually a beetle. Um, I know names are confusing, <laughs> but um, that's just the way it is. Uh, so again, this is an area that has just an absolute sheer uh, volume of diversity in it, um, which makes it quite interesting to study, but it also makes it very difficult to study um, because there are so many things out there. And it is um, sometimes very difficult to identify things um, to the species level. Uh, be some species of our native bees, for example, um, there's you know one or two very, very distinct field marks and you almost need to see um, a bee that's dead under a microscope to be able to tell them apart from each other. Um, and that's not something that we typically do when we do a survey. We're trying to leave um, as many things as we can out there alive um, because we want them on our preserves. So it's a bit of a challenge um, to understand uh, exactly what's out there from an insect's perspective. And then birds, as I said, this is an ongoing area of, of research for us. Um, and we do a lot of things with birds here at Wizard and Trails. Um, in general, about 220 species of birds inhabit the Wissick and Valley watershed kind of as a whole. Um, and that sort of takes us all the way from uh, Montgomery County down to the Schuylkill River um, in Philadelphia. And so um, not all of these species can be seen all the time. Some are only here in the summer, some are only here in the winter. Um, obviously some are very habitat dependent like ducks, excuse me, some like very open areas um, like the red-winged blackbird down here. Um, so again, um, what's out there is going to vary day to day, um, but about 200 species that we see on average um, using the habitat that we're providing. And we continue to study these because birds are a great indicator of the, um, how good the habitat is. They're very sensitive to environmental changes and they adapt relatively quickly to changes that are good or bad. Um, they'll leave if it's bad and they'll multiply if it's good and use it more. And so by surveying them regularly, we can get a sense of um, quickly sort of how things are going and keep our finger on the pulse of, of any changes that we're making from a habitat perspective to see if we're making improvements. And then fish. Um, there was a, a fish survey that was done um, up on, I think this, this survey actually kind of covered the entire length of the Wissahickon, not just the area that we managed in Montgomery County. So this included the parts in Philadelphia County as well. Um, but again, kind of the typical things that you would expect to see, um, fish like the sunfish over here, uh, the bluegill, which looks very much like a sunfish, uh, the rock bass, this white sucker, um, some smallmouth bass. There are trout stocked below Fort Washington. Um, but I am going to put out a caveat here that we um, do not permit fishing from our Wissahickon Trail properties. Um, and there's a couple reasons for that. But by and large, our, our part of the creek up here isn't great for fish. Uh, there are some up here, but we, we're in an area where we're very, very urbanized. Um, there's a lot of runoff from pavement and that impacts the creek very significantly. So this is actually a picture of the Wissahickon Creek. Um, I believe near Four Mills, um, actually. And what happens as a function of all of the things that happen with all of the, the runoff from paved areas, um, when the creek gets inundated because of a lot of heavy rain um, and the water runs really quickly down the creek because there's nothing to absorb that water before it hits the creek because of all the pavement, what happens is we create these really deep channels. So over here on the right-hand ed edge of the picture, you can see where all these tree roots are sticking out. And that's because water has just come past there really quickly and kind of scoured that bank out. And what happens is, is that lowers the level of the creek because it just keeps moving down and it keeps digging out and gouging out as more water hits it. Um, also then what happens is because things start getting filled in. So sediment moves quickly and then it gets deposited in the holes. 
And so there's not a lot of opportunities. We end up with a creek that's kind of wide, very shallow, not a lot of deep areas. Um, this also pushes trees back from the edge, so the water is not shaded, so it gets very hot, and it's very shallow, so it gets even hotter, and none of those conditions are good for fish to live in. So by and large, up on our end in, in Montgomery County, while there are some areas that have fish um, in them, it's not the most ideal um, environment for fish. And it is something that we continue to try to work to improve, because as we work to improve the overall characteristics of the creek, we will improve the habitats for fish that live in there. Um, so at this point, because kind of the habitats are impaired, the fish don't have it great to begin with, um, we have really tried to limit fishing and ask no fishing from our properties. Um, but down on the lower end of the Wissahickon and some of the areas along the Wissahickon up here that are not managed by us, you can fish um, in the creek if you're interested. So one last slide and then I'm going to stop for questions. Um, I thought it would be helpful to just give some sort of general wildlife watching tips. Um, everybody is a little bit different in how they approach this, but sort of some general kinds of things that you can think about. Um, one thing that's really helpful is to sort of pick a place and remain there. Um, if you've got a fallen log that you can just sit on and wait uh, and see what comes by, that's ideal. Um, the, the quieter and stiller that you are when you're out in these habitats, the better opportunity that you have of seeing something, um, especially something that you don't normally see. Um, Quiet, obviously, I think goes without saying, but the more noise that you're making in an area, the more animals um, who most often have much more acute senses of hearing than we do are going to be driven um, away from the area that you're in. Um, the best time to see animals is dawn and dusk. Um, that's when they're most active. Um, there's usually a push at dawn because they're trying to get out and feed. Um, after not having eaten overnight. Um, the night animals are going to bed at that time and, and at dusk it's the reverse. The daytime animals are going to find a place to roost or spend the night and the nighttime animals are starting to come out. So you have the greatest diversity of species that you're generally able to see in those dawn and dusk hours um, and also here as well. And that's the other thing is sometimes we don't actually get to see the animals, but we can very much look for animal signs. So we can look for scat. Um, this book over here in the corner, um, and I know this sounds really funny, it's a kid's book, Whose Poop Is That? It's actually a really good guide um, to understanding um, what the scat of different species looks like or their poop. Um, but oftentimes that is one of the best ways that we have to know, particularly mammals, um, that they're out there and what's out there. Um, and you can actually tell the difference between a fox and a coyote or a deer or a rabbit uh, by what their scat looks like. Um, we can often see fur. Um, deer, for, for example, like to rub on trees um, like this tree here. Um, particularly, this is where um, uh, male deer rub the velvet off of their antlers. Um, so they will scratch the trees up like this with their antlers, but other animals um, will actually rub against a tree to scratch an itch if they need to. Um, and we can often see uh, fur um, stuck in trees, um, you know, or on the ground um, in areas uh, as well. Prints and tracks. Um, these are raccoon tracks here. Um, and these are, again, another really good indication of species being around. And there's a number of, of good online species, uh, resources, and I forgot to put a link in here. When we put the um, presentation online, uh, in the description, I will make sure that there is a link for um, the good, a good uh, track website um, to take a look at. Um, leaving pets at home. If you wanna see wildlife, you can't take your dog with you. Um, those kinds of, having a dog with you is just gonna make the wildlife generally want to stay as far away from you as possible. Um, and so that is, you know, leave the pets at home when you're going to see wildlife. 
And neutral colors and limiting scent products on yourself, like um, colognes or aftershave, um, perfumes, those kinds of things, even scented lotion to some extent. Um, a lot of wildlife that we have in the area, uh, particularly mammals, are going to have a sense of smell that is much greater than ours, and they, um, you know, they're going to be able to smell you uh, before you will ever see them, and they will hide. Um, so, uh, keeping neutral colors uh, and limiting those scent products can help you um, as well, trying to find them and see them. Okay, I'm going to go to the chat here and see. Uh, what questions we have. Okay, can, uh, I'm gonna. Uh, a list of native species and plants of trees that we can plant. So, there is information on our website um, that will take you to some local resources that have really good um, lists of native species of plants and trees. Um, so I'm going to say that's probably the best way to um, uh, find out about native trees and plants for planting in your own yard. Um, somebody commented that they saw uh, a mink and a flying squirrel. That, so yay, great. I, they're, they're out there. So keep your eyes open. Um, pay attention. Yeah, spring peepers all spring in Fort Washington. Totally. Um, we've been out there. Uh, it was actually, I have to say, it was kind of a bit of a joke uh, within the organization for a long time that we had no peepers. Um, and so then whenever we go out as staff and we're doing surveys in the evening or I'm leading a walk, I lead a walk in the spring to look, go look for American woodcock. And it's often at the time of year when the spring peepers are calling and sure enough, they're calling and we just all absolutely crack up because yes, there are peepers in the watershed. Um, so again, though I think it speaks to the limitations of the surveys, um, and this is true of any kind of survey that you do for wildlife. And so it just means we have to continue to work to um, repeat surveys, make sure we're doing the best surveying that we can do, and um, keep targeting uh, certain things that we would expect to be there. So um, somebody asked a question about what are vernal pools. And literally, vernal pools are just things, um, areas of depressions often in. In a, in a woodland that fill up with rainwater and snow over the winter and then as the snow melts and turns into water and they stay, um, they stay wet um, into, depending on their location and their depth, uh, into the early summer and then they normally dry up. And that actual drying part of it is a very um, particular part of their life cycle. And so um, there are a number of species that only use vernal pools to breed in. And as I'm saying this out loud, I realize maybe I should do a vernal pool presentation for everybody because I get that question a lot. Um, so uh, do aquatic insects get counted? So they do get counted, but they get counted as part of our water quality monitoring program. Um, those are the macro invertebrates that are in the creek. And so um, damselfly, dragonfly larva, um, Dobson flies, crane flies, all of those kinds of things, they have aquatic larvae and they all get counted as part of our macroinvertebrate studies. So um, has the mix of birds been changing with climate change? You know, not so that I could say with any certainty. Um, I think we're seeing a little bit of differences in timing of things and we might be seeing a little bit of differences in numbers but it's really hard to tell um first of all for us a lot of these surveys are like this year would be their fifth year and because we're a relatively small geographic area it takes we don't have a lot of data and so to to make those kind of statements to say for sure that things have been changing um, actually would require a lot more data than we have. But that is the reason why we're starting to collect these things. Um, so, um, oh, somebody asked what time you can hear spring peepers in this area. Um, usually March, April, sometimes into May. 
um, usually as it starts to get warm coming into spring is the best time to hear them. Um, oh, somebody asked if I could go back and I will do this and then I'll go back to the questions. Well, I'll try. Go back to the bird slide and the, the birds that are along the bottom here. So starting from the left, um, we have a belted kingfisher, a female uh, red-winged blackbird, eastern kingbird, northern cardinal, orchard oriole, and golden crown kinglet. Um, somebody are there any american remaining american chestnut trees i don't think so but i would have to double check on that um i am much more on the birds and animal side than the plant side so um again i have to double check um I don't, I don't think that there are, to be honest with you. Um, somebody comments that they very rarely see chipmunks so compared to squirrels. Um, so chipmunks are one of those kinds of things that um, they tend to be a little bit less common in this area than squirrels to begin with. Um, the other thing is they have years that they have a ton of chipmunks and then years where there's hardly any. And a lot of that is driven by uh, the availability of food sources. So when food is very, very plentiful, they'll have um, much higher levels of young. And so the, that summer, there'll be a ton of chipmunks. Um, and then, you know, that kind of tapers off over the next few years. They are around um, for sure, um, but they're just, they're a bit more secretive uh, than squirrels to begin with. And they're just, um, uh, yeah, they're just not quite as common as squirrels. Um, what variety of owls have been seen? So in the watershed, we have great horned owls. We have barred owls occasionally. They have been known to nest um, down in the Wissahickon Park in the lower end of the Wissahickon, so in Philadelphia um, County. They, we had some up here earlier this spring, but we aren't we were not able to confirm that they actually nested here. Um, we stopped seeing them after a while. Uh, and so we think that they were maybe just visiting here for the end of winter and then went someplace else to breed. Um, we have Eastern screech owls, um, and those are the three most common. Um, we have had long-eared owls in the winter on one of our preserves. And we have, um, we would expect to see possibly uh, northern saw wet owls, again, only in the winter, um, but they are possible. And we have had the occasional, <laughs> and this is very short lived, uh, snowy owl show up in the watershed um, in years when the snowy owl population is very large in the Arctic. Um, they will migrate south uh, in the winter and spend the winter in this area and there have been a couple times where they've turned up in areas of the watershed they tend to be um, they like tundra where they nest so um, generally speaking they like to be in big open places so um, places that have a lot of meadow area um, and the best place like for that in this area is um, uh, natural lands wanted preserve um, not it's not one that we manage but it has a lot of open grassland um so i wouldn't be surprised you know to see one another snowy owl show up so um somebody asked a question about uh, uh, coyotes we are going to talk about coyotes in a little bit um any locally extinct species that we want to bring back oh uh, well i wouldn't say i extinct is probably not the right word it's probably more extirpated so things that were here or should be here that aren't here um, but that still live in other areas so spotted salamanders is a good one we know they're in the lower end of the wissahickon we have not been able to confirm that they're up here um, we would love to bring them up here those are one of those creatures that uses vernal pools very much um, so if we can get some vernal pool habitat established it would be great to um, be able to have spotted salamanders here. Um, 
Wood frogs is another one. If they're not here, um, there are ways that um, egg masses can be transported and um, you know, it would be wonderful to bring them back as well to sort of complete um, the, uh, uh, the list of, of uh, frogs that should be here. Um, from a bird perspective, a couple that I can think of just offhand, we don't have a lot of uh, ground nesting species in this area. So there's a small warbler called an oven bird um, that should nest here. Um, but it doesn't, mostly because there's not enough cover on the ground anymore because of all the deer. So um, that's uh, um, the ones, probably, you know, the ones I can think of right off the top of my head. There's probably more. Um, do birds of prey typically nest in the areas are they primarily seen hunting? So if so red tail hawks are definitely nesting in the area. Cooper's hawks definitely nest in the area. Um, kestrels nest in um, Erdenheim Farms, uh, Dixon Meadow area, and they um, uh, there's a box. They they maintain a kestrel box, um, and that's actually something that we're thinking about trying to. Um, uh, establish um, some kestrel boxes on some of our preserves that have open area for the kestrels to hunt. Um, owls are a bird of prey, so they are definitely here. Um, beyond, there are eagles that have nested um, in the watershed. Um, not that we've been able to confirm directly on any of our preserves, um, but they are there. And oftentimes people report seeing bald eagles um, cruising up and down the creek um, on a regular basis. So there are definitely birds of prey um, that nest in the watershed for sure. So I'm going to stop here um, and move on to the next section, and I will come back uh, and um, uh, answer questions um, again once we get through uh, the next section. So what I want to do next is talk about the idea of keystone species. Slides are stuck. Okay, so a keystone is the key. The word keystone comes from architecture, essentially, and it's this big block here in the middle of an arch that supports the weight of the arch, or a lot of the weight of the arch, and allows it to keep standing. Um, we have keystones as the keystone state um, on a lot of, and there's differing reasons about why we're named the keystone state, so I'm not gonna go into that, but we do have the keystone symbol um, as part of our state logo and on our license plates and all of those kinds of things. Um, and that's, you know, the symbol for Pennsylvania is that sort of keystone shape. Um, and that's where that comes from, uh, from architecture. And ecologists have um, expanded this idea to talk about species at the environmental level. And so keystone species in this case are really kind of the glue that holds a habitat together. And if they're removed, they can turn the structure and the biodiversity of that habitat will look very different um, if they're not there. And keystone species actually have a disproportionately large effect on the functioning of their environment. Um, given the numbers that they have. So they don't necessarily have to be the most plentiful species in an area to be a keystone species. And in fact, most of the time they're not. Um, it's just the functions that they perform in the environment. If they're removed, um, that environment will no longer look like that. So, um, and they fall into several broad categories. Um, so predator, prey, ecosystem engineer, which we will talk about, um, mutualist, which we will talk about, um, and plants, because they don't really fall into any of these other categories. The plants are kind of mutualists, meaning they do one thing and they support a, a species and a species may support them back, but it's not quite the same. So they kind of are their own category. Um, and we're going to talk about four 
keystone species that we have in our area. We're gonna talk about coyotes, salamanders, bats, and oak trees. And if we didn't have any one of these things, our environment would look much, much different than it is. And almost all of these things right now are under significant amount of pressure in our area. And so these are the things that we are trying to do as an organization to try to improve the habitats to make sure that these keystone species stay in our area and have the resources that they need. We're going to talk about coyotes first. Um, and coyotes, they're a predator. And so they perform what we call top-down regulation. So they prey on smaller animals like foxes, cats, possums, raccoons, um, but they'll also eat snakes and you know, they kind of will eat anything that they can get their teeth on. Um, but largely they prey on small animals that are smaller than themselves. And those animals that they prey on are animals that will prey, for example, on birds or bird eggs um, specifically. So things like possums and raccoons or raccoons specifically and snakes will often go after birds nests. And so the coyote plays a very significant role as a predator by keeping those population levels of those smaller animals in check, which benefits the birds. And so that whole connectedness of that is really important. And if we don't have that higher level predator, and right now the coyote is the highest level predator that we have in our area um, because we don't have wolves anymore. And we, very rarely have bears. Occasionally we do, um, but not in any numbers uh, and not that really play a significant role in our area. Bears that we have here tend to be transient and moving through the area from one place to another. Um, we, um, so the coyote has taken on a really, really significant role in terms of being a predator, the, the main predator that we have right now. Um, to keep those smaller animal populations in check. Um, in addition, coyote actually do somewhat hunt and eat deer um, as well. So they can some, sometimes help keep um, deer populations in check, although they're more likely to just feed on roadkill deer than they are to hunt deer themselves um, because deer are still a little bit big for a lot of them to bring down, but they can help. Um, I don't, in answer to the question before, I don't know, I don't have a really good sense of the numbers of the population. That's not something that we've looked at. We were more looking at presence or absence of things. Um, and coyote are actually a little bit difficult to, to study in terms of numbers because they kind of form packs, but they're very loose packs and they often still hunt singly or is as a pair, even though they're in a pack. So the, it makes the numbers really hard um, to try to assess when, when um, uh, biologists do surveys on coyotes. In our area, the best places that we've had people report them and, and know that they're there is um, at our Willow Lake Preserve and our Armand Trout Preserve. And on our website, there's a very, um, on our homepage, you can get to an interactive map. So you can go check out all our preserves if you're not familiar with them and you can see how to get there, where to park, um, where the trail access is and all of those kinds of things. So please take a look at our website if you're not familiar. Um, these two uh, trail cam pictures here, these two gray pictures, these are actually pictures that came from our study. These were from the trail cam at Willow Lake that they set up when they were doing this, the survey excuse me, and the coyotes that are out there. Um, these guys are extremely adaptable, even in urban areas. So their populations are actually probably increasing a little bit um, because they don't have a lot of, of, of pressure um, coming down on them because they are sort of that top level predator. Um, the best sign of them is usually the scat that you see. Um, it has a twisted character to it and it can contain a mix of bones or seeds or fur. Um, the biggest telltale sign of this is that it's usually left in the middle of a path uh, and that's to, an easy way of letting other coyotes know that they were there. Um, and so oftentimes um, this cat that you'll see as you're walking on the trails 
um, is either fox or coyote. Um, and it's a size difference. And usually the, um, the fox is more seeds and less fur, um, but it, you know, there can be a little bit of both um, in them. Um, but mostly, you know, it's, it's a way of, of letting everybody know that they're there. And that's usually the best sign that the coyotes are there around. Um, they are often more heard more than they are seen. Uh, they have a variety of yips and barks and howls. And if you've never heard one, I encourage you to go onto the internet and just search, you know, coyote howl. And, and they're, um, they can be very loud when there's a group of them together. And typically, um, the larger groups of them form more in the winter. And um, it's believed that that's, again, more to sort of help um, them hunt. Um, and the best time to see them is at dawn or dusk, um, just like about every everything that we're going to talk about here. So um, they do use dens for raising their young. Um, those can be hollowed out logs. They can dig their own. They can reuse fox dens or groundhog burrows, um, those kinds of things. Um, they really only use dens when they're breeding, though, to raise the pups. They don't, otherwise they sleep out in the open. Um, they don't use dens when they're not breeding. Um, and um, the a coyote pair, so kind of like wolves, there's typically an alpha pair in an area or a territory, and um, their territories can kind of overlap more than wolves do, again, which is what makes it difficult to count how many are out there um, and get a true count of the population, but there can be an alpha pair, and then um, Usually their young will disperse at about six months of age, but sometimes they'll hang around for a little bit longer and sort of form this loose pack, um, particularly through the winter. And then, you know, young that have dispersed from other areas may come in and stay for the winter and or even into the next breeding se season and help the alpha pair raise the next generation. Um, and then they may go off. That pair, though, that's the breeding pair, tends to be um, fairly monogamous and stay together. A lot of times the research has shown until one of them dies. Um, they, they tend to be um, paired um, for, you know, we say for life um, as much as uh, they can be um, and, and a pretty stable uh, pair structure from that perspective. So um, just to dispel a few myths, um, they're typically not an aggressive species. They are generally more afraid of you than you are of them. Um, they can sometimes be loosely aggressive, and I use that term generally, um, particularly during the breeding season and when they have pups. So that's going to be late winter into the beginning of summer as the pups are grown, growing. Um, and you know, that's the kind of time that you do want to be aware of things, um, as particularly if you're at preserves like Willow Lake or Armatrout. Um, but again, 90% of the time, if you see a coyote, it's going to be the tail end of it running away from you. Um, you might get a glimpse as it turns and looks at you on the trail, and then it's going to turn and melt into the woods, and you're never going to see it again. Um, they, they typically are going to be more scared of you. And if if for some reason it seems like they're not scared of you, making noise like clapping your hands again, making yourself seem bigger, um, just like a lot of species, um, will make them turn away. This though is a really another really good reason why you should keep your dog on a leash um, at all times if you're walking dogs on the preserves, um, not just our preserves, but anywhere in the area, because if there are coyotes out there, they can tend to be more aggressive towards dogs. And especially if that dog is not with a human. Um, and so that's a, a really good um, warning to uh, keep your dogs on a leash um, because it's gonna lessen the potential for uh, interactions, uh, particularly with coyotes. Um, So again, very important role as a predator. Uh, and if things, if they were not here, um, things would be much different uh, in terms of uh, the level of smaller animals that we would have and the knock-on effects that that would have on everything um, further down in that food web. Um, salamanders, I'm gonna switch gears a little bit here. And um, there's two kinds of salamanders that we have general kinds. Um, there's actually a variety of species, um, but in general, salamanders are either aquatic or they're terrestrial. 
And the aquatic salamanders do actually have a terrestrial phase, so it can be a little confusing. But the aquatic salamanders and this um, northern red salamander here on the left-hand side is a really good example of that here in the watershed. These guys require water uh, to lay their eggs. Their young are actually form larvae that have gills and they live in the water um, like a tadpole or a fish until they get to the point where they're ready to be an adult and then their gills close up and their tail um, becomes more of a terrestrial tail and they grow more substantial legs than just sort of these little leg buds that they have when they're in the water and then as an adult they become a terrestrial species. They're typically not far found far from water even as an adult um, because they definitely rely on the water to um, complete their their breeding cycle so that's really important. Um, the fully terrestrial uh, salamanders on the other hand they don't need water for their life cycle they lay eggs under um, logs or rocks in the woods and the newly hatched salamanders look exactly like the adults they're just smaller um, kind of like us <laughs> and it just takes them a while to grow to their fully adult size um, and the uh, eastern redback salamander down here on the right is a really good example of that and the most common salamander that we actually have in the watershed um, and this comes in two varieties. It comes in the red back with the red stripe running down the back, and then it comes in what's known as a lead phase. So this all dark one. And when you see it up close, it actually does have a contrasting back color to it a little bit, uh, but it's not sort of this reddish stripe down the back. Um, but those, and they just are different varieties, kind of like uh, Labrador retrievers that come in yellow and brown and black. Um, these are the same thing. That's not a sex difference. It's not an age difference. Um, there's some thought that it might be an environmental difference, but they haven't really been able to prove that yet. So salamanders are keystone species in two ways. Um, they're predators. So they help regulate um, the forest floor invertebrate species, so worms, snails, and other insects that live in the leaf litter and in the uh, soil level of the forest. And then they, they themselves are actually preyed upon by the next level of species above them, such as small mammals or birds. So they kind of play a dual role as predator and prey. Um, but they're more important as a keystone species because of them being a predator and helping keep those invertebrate populations in check. And the reason that's really important is because most of those invertebrate populations that, they, that the salamanders eat, they're eating leaves and leaf litter. And if the salamanders didn't keep them in check, they would completely go through the leaf litter which would lead to soil erosion, it would lead to um, increased dryness and reduced moisture levels of the forest floor for the trees and changes in humidity levels within the forest and all of those other things that come from having that, that litter layer on the bottom of the forest floor. And so salamanders play a key role in helping keep that leaf litter um, there. They also play a role as a system engineer because they, they dig burrows. Um, and so they're helping um, cycle carbon through the system, through moving um, their prey and then their waste products through the soil, they're aerating the soil and those kinds of things. Um, another system engineer is a beaver, actually. Um, and when we think about that, when a beaver um, chews down trees, builds a dam, floods an area, uh, makes essentially a pond behind that dam um, for itself to live on. That's a system engineer kind of a, um, role. And that's what salamanders play on the forest floor. And it's funny that they do that because they're really tiny and we hardly know they're there, but they're really important um, in the role that they play. So they're kind of a key um, uh, indicator of the health of the forest. The terrestrial salamanders are lungless, so they do gas exchange through their skin, which makes them extremely vulnerable to environmental pollutants. 
And so that's one of the ways that we can help learn about the, how clean our environment is by looking at the salamanders that are out there and trying to get a sense of that. Um, and this also requires them to have a certain level of moisture in their environment. So that's why even the fully terrestrial ones are hidden under logs and rocks and you know, in damp areas um, because they need to stay sort of wet to, even though they don't need to live in water, they need to stay damp so that they can um, breathe and create that gas exchange to um, breathe. So that's why we often don't see them. Um, you can go look for them. And I kind of encourage you to do that um, within, within reason, I'm gonna say, and I'll give you some guidelines here. So obviously the best times to see these guys, this one, dawn or dusk doesn't matter so much. So, you know, this is more about the weather. Um, so it needs to be cool. So spring and fall are the best times to see salamanders. July and August, not so much. Um, after rain is also a really good time because that tends to um, bring them more to the surface because there's more surface moisture for them to work with. Um, as it gets drier and hotter, they go deeper and so they become harder to find. Where you wanna look for them is just about anywhere in the watershed. Um, in the woods for the most part. You're not gonna see them really in the middle of a field or things like that, but in wooded areas, um, there should be salamanders and they're gonna be under rocks and logs and things like that. So yeah, go ahead um, on the edge of the trail and you see an interesting looking log, turn it over gently. See if there's a salamander underneath of it. Take a picture with your phone. Um, I would recommend that you lift logs gently and replace gently because there are other things that live under there and that is essentially their entire house that you're moving. So don't go flipping over every single log or every single rock in an area. Look at a couple and then move to an entirely different area. Um, you also wanna be careful how you replace the rocks or the logs. You don't wanna set it back down on the salamander. Often if you put your fingers down, you don't have to pick it up. Um, and I would probably encourage you not to for the most part, but if you put your fingers down, you can kind of make it move to the edge and then put the, the log down as close to possible without putting it right on top of the, the salamander because you don't want to squish them when you put the, the log or rock back down. Um, but you can um, certainly go look for them um, you know, while you're out there. And I would encourage you to because they are a real, really important part of our environment um, and something that most of us don't ever see. Um, bats. So bats are a keystone species um, as a predator and as a mutualist. So I'm going to use, um, we have a couple of different species of bats in the watershed. Um, bats are something that require special permits to study. And so we don't actually have really good numbers on um, the, the absolute species that we have in the area. We kind of know what should be around. Um, and this is something that we're continuing to try to, to do a little bit more research on and get some help for um, further study. But I'm gonna use the little brown bat, which is probably the most common bat in our area, as an example um, for talking about bats tonight. So bats are a predator. They can eat over a thousand mosquitoes in an hour. Um, typically they can eat over 30% of their body weight in insects every single night um, that they're out feeding. Um, nursing females, because they are mammals, they do nurse their young, nursing females can eat up to 110% of their body weight in insects. Um, and it's been estimated that a million bats eat 694 tons of insects in a year. And largely mosquitoes are their favorite prey. Um, but they will, you know, go after any kind of flying insect at night. They eat moths, um, other insects that are moving around um, at dawn or dusk. Again, this is, oh, this is a, a female with a pup. Um, females tend to form colonies with other females. Um, they, um, pregnant bats aren't able to regulate their body temperature very well. So they form colonies where they can all roost together and that helps them all regulate their body temperature. And then as they have their pups, when the pups are really little, they actually fly on the mother while she goes out to feed. And then as they get a little bit bigger, that gets awkward. And so all the pups will stay 
wherever the uh, moms have roosted together, the pups all stay in the nursery together um, and kind of grow up together uh, until they're old enough to go out and hunt at about three to four weeks of age. Um, so they are best seen at dawn and dusk. They are largely nocturnal. Um, they tend to feed for their foraging phase at lasts for about one to five hours um, after the sun goes down or as the sun is going down. Um, and they, um, you know, get their, they find their prey through um, their, their echolocation sonar uh, and, and sending out um, signals to, that they can hear, we can't hear them. Um, and so again, usually the only way that you're gonna see, see a bat is to see it fly by. Um, they have a very erratic flight pattern, so they're usually pretty obvious when they're out there. And they are really everywhere in our area. Um, they're probably in your backyard, um, whether you know it or not. Um, and in fact, you kind of want them in your backyard, you just don't want them living in your attic. Um, so bats are under an incredible amount of pressure right now, and they play a humongous role in helping regulate insect populations. And so um, their decline is, is not good. Now, part of their decline may be due to declining insect levels, but by and large, that's probably not the thing that's really impacting bats right now. Um, habitat loss, particularly safe roosting areas, is a big one. Um, we tend to cut down dead trees that have hollow logs in them or hollow holes in them where bats can roost. Um, and obviously we don't want them in our attics and, and things like that. And so um, they're limited in the places that they can roost. And then they're also suffering pressure from disease, um, particularly white nose syndrome, which you probably may have heard of um, in the news. And it kind of gets really loud in the news and then it gets quiet. It's still around. Um, it's still a problem. Scientists are continuing to try to understand it. It's actually a fungus that affects hibernating bats in the winter. And because bats hibernate in humongous numbers in the winter, largely in caves or abandoned mines and things like that, it spreads to a huge number of them uh, and actually kills them in a lot of cases. And so that's why it's such an impact. Um, because there's so many of them in one place. Uh, there's not really a known treatment or cure, but something that researchers are continuing to look at uh, and trying to figure out how to manage uh, moving forward. So um, this, one of the things that we can do to help bats is to put up bat boxes. And that's what this picture down here at the bottom is. Um, this is what a bat box looks like. Bats actually roost in a couple of different ways. They have what's called a day roost, which is exactly what it sounds like, where they will stay during the daylight hours. Um, but then they also have a night roost. Um, and as I said, the foraging lasts, you know, one to five hours. It depends on how hungry the bat is, how many insects are flying, what the weather is, all of those kinds of things. And the bats will go to their night roost when they're done foraging. And, and they stay there until it gets close to dawn um, before they go back to their day roost. And the reason for that is they usually expel all of their waste products at their night roost, which they can move around. And then they may be the only bat at that night roost. And so if they um, expelled all their waste products, it's called guano in a bat, their poop. If they, if they expelled that all, in their day roost when they're all together, that guano would build up and attract predators. And snakes and raccoons and all squirrels even sometimes can go after bats while they're in their roosts during the day. Um, they are pretty much strictly nocturnal and it's really, really rare to see a bat flying during the day. And so they're really kind of, um, it's, it's a safety thing for them. So the, these kinds of bat boxes can serve either as a night roost or a day roost. It depends on the bat, it depends on the species, it depends on the location. Um, and there's no really good way of knowing um, which kind of uh, location the bats will choose for using the roost. It's all entirely up to them. Um, but these kinds of bat boxes are really helpful. We have a couple at Crossways Preserve 
And there are also now several that um, Whitpain Township put up on Armand Trout Preserve as well. So those are kind of really good places at dawn or dusk that you can go out and stand on the trail um, and see the boxes and see if you can see bats coming in or out of them. Um, and, you know, as, as an opportunity to sort of um, study bats a little bit closer up, so to speak. Um, a couple of things, just uh, uh, some myths about bats that I'd like to dispel a little bit, because I think a lot of times people are like, I don't like bats. I don't want bats near me. And while it's true, you really shouldn't let bats roost in your attic. Um, they can carry disease. They can be rabies vectors, which is why they require special permits to study um, as a researcher. The actual incidence of transmission from bats to rabies is rather low, um, mostly because as just a human walking on a trail, um, bats are pretty much going to leave you alone. Um, they're going to use their sonar and they're going to see that you're there and they may come close to you, if, especially if you've got bugs flying around your, your head, um, but they are very unlikely to run into you. They're very unlikely to bite you, um, just, you know, being there. Um, now, when you get them in your house, it's a little bit of a different story, which is why we want to make sure that we keep, you know, our attic vents adequately protected and covered and our, you know, no holes in the siding and those kinds of things. Um, because, you know, as bats, um, an, an entire colony of bats can be more likely to have rabies and they can also spread um, a couple of other diseases to humans. Again, the incidence of that is relatively rare and it's more impactful if you tend to visit them in their bat caves where they're spending the winter. Um, and so if you don't go into the caves, chances are you're not going to catch a disease from a bat. So again, keep that in mind. And if you have an area where you would feel comfortable and there's plenty of resources online about the proper orientation of bat houses and things like that and what they should look like. There's kits you can buy. There's ready-made ones you can buy. Um, I'd encourage you to put a bat house, you know, on your property if you can. Um, you don't necessarily have to have it on your house. You can set it, you know, towards the back side of your property if you have a proper orientation um, and that kind of thing. But um, they are really good creatures to have around and uh, definitely help keep insect populations in check. And the last keystone species that I'm going to talk about, and I'm going to do this quickly, is oak trees. And it sounds funny to switch from mammals and bats and coyotes and stuff and talk about oak trees, but oak trees serve multiple what we call ecosystem services. So they are absolutely critical habitat, um, food, shelter, for a variety of species. Um, Things eat, excuse me, the sapling trees themselves like deer. Obviously, um, woodpeckers and blue jays and squirrels and chipmunks and deer and other animals eat the acorns that fall. Um, they serve as a host plant to over 500 species of moths and butterfly caterpillars. And I'm talking not just in Pennsylvania, this is sort of in general. Um, but there are a load of species of moths and butterflies that use oaks as a host plant. And we're going to talk about why that's really important um, in the next slide. But in addition to that kind of stuff, oak trees, um, they're big, they live long, and so they um, are really, really important to help control soil erosion, provide water table management and groundwater, water levels. Um, they provide carbon sequestration in their leaves. They help filter air and water pollutants. And because of the large size of their canopy and the number of leaves that they have in the summer, they can help moderate temperature extremes, um, which can be really important in a forest and keeping um, the, the understory of the forest cool and damp for creatures like salamanders to live in. Um, Oaks are struggling in our area for a couple of reasons. Um, the largest one is due to overbrowsing by deer. And so the picture on the left is kind of what a normal understory should look like. On the right is what a lot of our understories look like because the deer just eat everything in sight. There's too many deer and oaks are a particular delicacy. 
So they impact the oaks in a couple of different ways. The too many deer eat too many acorns, so there's less oak saplings to begin with. And the few saplings that do survive, deer love to eat oak saplings, so they eat them right down to the nub and they, they won't grow anymore. They basically kill the sapling. And so the next generation of oaks isn't in our forests. Um, and that's really critical as we lose oaks and we are losing oaks to age. We're losing oaks to diseases that are impacting them. There's oak wilt in the east and sudden oak, del oak death in the west. Um, pests like the gypsy moth can impact oak trees. Um, climate change may be stressing the trees and playing a role in all of this as well. And so they're really kind of under a lot of threats from a lot of different um, directions. And they are a really important tree to make sure that we keep in the forest. In our area, we have two general groups and there's a number of species within these groups. Uh, the top picture here is the, this is a white oak. And so the white oak group, these guys have rounded leaves. Um, the bark itself is grayer and kind of scaly looking. And these acorns um, tend to mature in one season. And so they drop them every year. Um, the red oak group, they have pointed leaves. So you can see here the points on the end of their leaves. Their bark is dark and furrowed. And these acorns take two seasons to mature. So they don't necessarily drop acorns every year. Both of these groups can have what's called a mast year, which is an overproduction of acorns. And that mast year is, it varies. It's usually, it can be three to five years between them. Um, and there's just a ton of acorns all dropped at the same time um, by all of the trees in an area. And this leads to, um, it's thought that it's kind of a defense mechanism for the tree. If every year, every, every few years, they pour a lot of energy into making a ton of acorns, then the chances that some of those acorns turn into saplings and another generation of trees is higher because there's so many of them and the animals just can't eat all of them because there's so many of them. Um, but it does lead to um, things like, this is when the chipmunks make more chipmunks, when there's a lot more acorns around from a mast year. So um, they do help fuel the reproduction of other species, but it's still a defense mechanism for the tree to try to get more trees made um, down the road. The importance of caterpillars. So, this is a Carolina chickadee for those of you who are not familiar with birds. Um, this is a relatively common bird of our area. This is a Carolina chickadee nest. Um, they're cavity nesters, so they nest in holes in trees or they will come to nest boxes um, and use nest boxes to raise their young. Um, they have on average about five chicks in a nest. They can range from three to 10, um, depending, uh, but on average it's about five. This is an inchworm. So this is actually a caterpillar form of a geometer moth. Geometers are a family of moths that have over 1400 species in the US and Canada, but a lot of their caterpillars look like this. Sometimes they're brown, sometimes they don't always have the yellow stripe on them, but they all, all of our inchworms are all geometer caterpillar, or geometer moth caterpillars. Um, so as this caterpillar um, approaches adulthood, you know, it will stop, it will make a cocoon, and it will turn into a moth. These caterpillars are a very important source of food for chickadees and other birds, but we're going to use the chickadee as an example. Um, and the reason why is because this is a very soft, very easily digestible source of very high protein for chicks to eat. So it's very easy for mama and papa chickadee to go find caterpillars and bring them back to the nest and provide very satisfying meals for all of their little babies. So observations of chickadee nests have concluded that one chickadee nest needs 400 to 600 caterpillars a day to feed their babies. That's 6,000 to 9,000 caterpillars for a 16 to 20 day nesting cycle. 
So that 16 to 20 days is the time between the eggs hatching and when those babies leave the nest. And so it's actually probably more than that, more than that six to 9,000 caterpillars because the parents will continue to feed the babies um, on their, for a little bit after they leave the nest, but it's harder to count because they're moving around. So this is just based on um, watching chickadee parents bring caterpillars to the nest. That's a lot of caterpillars. Um, and so this is why oak trees are so important because so many of these species of moths in particular that make these little inchworm caterpillars or are these little inchworm caterpillars in that, that cycle of their development, they are such an important food source for birds um, and, and uh, connected to the oak trees. And so we, that's you know, all the reason why we need this. One hypothesis, projects that monitor birds and, and monitor chickadee numbers in particular, like Christmas bird counts, Project Feeder Watch, and breeding bird surveys, seem to be showing a decline in chickadee numbers. And one hypothesis for this is reduced food for feeding. So they have less successful nest attempts. And part of that is declines in insects and not being able to find enough caterpillars um, to feed their young. And a decline in oak trees in an area uh, may also be playing a role you know, in that decline of, of insects and caterpillars in specifics. Um, but that is something that needs uh, a little bit more research. So I forgot to insert a question slide here, but I'm going to stop and see if there's any new questions. And if you've got any, feel free to uh, jump on them. And we and I will um, see what I can get. So where were we here? Common bees. Uh, you know, Bumblebees are pretty common. Honeybees are actually pretty common. There's a number of beekeepers in the area that have hives in the area. Um, there's a variety of native bees in our area. And um, I'm trying to think what's the best source of information on that. I may. We don't have that information on our website anymore, our revamp of website. We took a lot of that off and we're still in the process of, of reformatting it um, to our new website format. So those are probably the most common ones, but we do have a number of native bees um, that are ground nesting bees and um, mason bees that will use um, hollow stems from plants um, in your garden and things like that. So um, it's, there's, yeah. There's a lot of different bees. I'm not actually technically sure which one is the most common. So I'm sorry I can't answer that question. I do not know. Somebody asked what's the incidence of rabies in the area and I don't know um, right off the top of my head. Um, somebody commented we had a bat house and never saw any use it. Yeah, it can be iffy. It's, we were told when we put the bat houses up um, that it can take, uh, um, three to four years sometimes for them to find it and use it. Um, so, you know, it's, it, it's a crapshoot to some extent. I hate to say that, um, but um, offering them is better than not offering them if you have the opportunity and the space to do it um, because sometimes they will use it uh, and that can be really important um, to keep them in an area. Um, what about black walnut trees? Can they be helpful to wildlife like oak trees or act as a substitute for oaks? So they can be helpful to wildlife, but not exactly in the same way as oak trees. So black walnut trees um, actually can be a little bit toxic to the soil around them. So there's, they limit the things that grow right underneath of them um, because of the compounds that they put out. And a lot of species can't get to the walnuts themselves, um, the way that they can get to an acorn. So squirrels can sometimes wait for them to start to open on their own, the walnuts, um, but a lot of birds, the walnuts are just too hard for them, the shells on the outside are too hard for them to get to the useful meat, um, whereas they can, blue jays can peck into an acorn um, relatively easily. So they're not exactly a substitute. They still do have wildlife value, 
Um, and there are some particular species of moths that use walnuts as their host plant. Um, so they're going to have caterpillars and other insects on them as well that are useful to feed um, birds and things, but they're not, they don't exactly function in the environment the same way as the oak trees do. Um, So the question, are bats, are bats good for mosquito control? And what do, you, what, what do I recommend for controlling mosquitoes without harming other insects? So um, bats are good mosquito control, yes. And what I recommend for controlling mosquitoes is um, a couple of things. One, make sure you don't have any standing water in your environment. So um, if you have bird baths, make sure you clean it out frequently because the process of cleaning it out is going to make sure you get rid of any mosquito larvae that might be in there, and that's just perfectly fine. Um, but make sure that there's no other areas of standing water because that's going to be the number one thing that brings uh, mosquitoes to your environment to try to lay eggs uh, and make more little baby mosquitoes. So um, that's number one. The other is to um, and this is kind of, you kind of have to have a balance. So keeping your lawn short and not letting areas get overgrown is another really good way of controlling mosquitoes uh, because they will tend to like to kind of roost and hide in the taller grass area. Now, the caveat to that is things like, beneficial things like lightning bugs, um, and some moths actually will also roost in higher levels of grass and um, uh, vegetative areas that are a little bit more overgrown. So you kind of have to find a balance um, for yourself and your own property. It kind of also depends on what your neighbors are doing. If you live in, a, in an area that neighbors are relatively close, um, you may not really be able to do a whole lot to control mosquitoes because they may not be doing it. So um, those kinds of things. I don't recommend pesticides. They're gonna harm more than they're gonna help. Um, I also do not recommend bug lights. Um, but bug lights and, and bug zappers put out ultraviolet lights. Mosquitoes are not attracted to ultraviolet lights. What are attracted to ultraviolet lights are moths. So if you put out a bug zapper, you're probably not getting very many mosquitoes, but you're actually killing a lot of moths. Um, and so uh, I wouldn't recommend um, bug zappers. Now, a bug zapper that you uh, figure out how to take the zappy part out of it and turn it on the ultraviolet light without the zappy part is an off awesome moth attractant uh, to be able to see a variety of species of moths in your yard. Um, just make sure that you can turn the zapper part off. Um, those are probably the best. It's standing water, not a lot of overgrown areas, and those are really the best things that you can do. Um, don't go out, and this is, this is going to sound bad, because dawn and dusk are the worst times for mosquitoes, and they're the best time to see everything else. So protect yourself, long clothes. Um, insect repellent on yourself or your clothes um, actually works. If you don't want to put it on yourself, spray your shirt, um, spray your hat to keep them away from your head those kinds of things. Um, and then you're gonna have less of an impact on um, other um, insects in the area. Um, last question here for this section, is it good to put out insects for nesting birds? Um, you can, yeah, they're gonna need so many that it's, you know, they're, they're gonna stop by um, if you've got stuff out. Um, mealworms are great for um, bluebirds and they will readily come to feeders um, that have mealworms in them. Um, Whenever I fed mealworms, I never had many other species using them, like chickadees or things like that. Um, so, uh, you know, it's not going to hurt them, um, but you're not going to be able to put out enough, really, to be the bulk of the, the uh, material that they're going to feed their young. So, um, you know, it's, it's up to you. Um, moths should be considered a beneficial insect. Absolutely, moths should be considered a beneficial insect. Um, their caterpillars, as we've just seen, are very, very important. Um, and they're not really a pest. They're actually a pollinator. 
um, and they serve a function of pollination at night and for um, some species of plants um, that use um, pheromone kinds of attractants to the moths to collect their pollen um, in ways that uh, bees and hummingbirds and other things that work as pollinators um, don't do, uh, don't attract. So um, I encourage you to check out the moth uh, presentation um, later this summer um, so you can learn about why moths are um, not just a pest. There are some species that are pests, but not most of them actually. So um, to wrap up here real quick, uh, you can be a wildlife monitor and help us. So okay, we have a variety of citizen science projects that we are running um, in the watershed. So we have nest boxes on our preserves. We are working to train people to identify frog calls to go out and listen for things like wood frogs. Um, we have salamander monitors that go out to um, specific sites that I have placed boards um, that are, you know, there's a group of 10 boards that are together and they go and look for what salamanders are under them. And when they find salamanders, they actually weigh them and measure them, excuse me, and identify the species of them. We have people that help uh, raise monarch butterflies and go monitor the milkweed in our preserves and look at the other insects that are using the milkweed. Uh, this down here, I talked earlier about American woodcock surveys that we do. This down here in the lower right hand corner is an American woodcock, a bird that uses our preserves uh, on migration. Uh, we believe they breed here, but we haven't been able to confirm it. Um, they have a very specific habitat of uh, sort of wet woods and open fields, and they eat earthworms largely. Uh, that's why they need the wet woods so that they can use that long bill and probe into the, the soil and find earthworms and other uh, invertebrates in the, in the soil. Um, and so we have monitors that go out and look for those. And then um, over here on the top right, this is a spice bush swallowtail butterfly caterpillar. Um, one of my favorite caterpillars of the butterflies. It just looks like a cartoon character um, with its false eye spots there to uh, ward off predators. Uh, these guys live exclusively on spice bushes, which we have a ton of in the watershed. Um, but we have volunteers that go out and um, do caterpillar surveys on plants uh, throughout the watershed. Uh, right now, it's actually only on two of our preserves, but we're expanding that um, to a number of other preserves as we continue to write management plans. So an opportunity to go out and look for caterpillars and other insects on a variety of trees and uh, report that data. So I'm not gonna go into detail on any of these projects. I just wanted to make you aware that they are out here and things that we're doing. So um, on our website, on our take action section, there is a section about volunteering and there is a whole, there's in more, much more detailed information than I can do in this presentation about the project specifics, kind of the time required, um, and what you would actually be doing. And so I encourage you to go and take a look at that on our website. And if something sounds interesting to you, um, fill out the volunteer uh, information form that's there. And in the comments section, just write which particular project you're interested in. And I will get that information and I will make sure that you get on the right list so that the next time we have trainings, um, you know, you can be included in that uh, to learn a little bit more about the projects. So um, please uh, take a look at that. The other one that you can do totally on your own, and I really, really, really encourage you to do this because it's so much fun, um, is iNaturalist. And iNaturalist is an app that you can put on your phone or a website that you can put on your computer or both. Um, but basically it's an online social network that shares biodiversity information and crowdsources species identification. So you can go out and take a picture of something and you know a flower that you see alongside of the trail as you're taking a hike um, on the Green Ribbon Trail. And even if you don't know what it is, you can use the iNaturalist app to help you figure out the identification. It will make suggestions for you. And then the crowdsource part of this is other people will see what you've put on there and what has been suggested by the program as an identification. 
and they'll either agree that yes, that's what it is, or they'll they may disagree and say no, it's this. You know, the the machine was wrong essentially, and 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 then let other people comment on it so that it makes the machine learns essentially. And I have to tell you, when I first started using this a couple of years ago, it was not very good at its predictive ability to say what something was, you know, you would put in a plant and, and, and it wasn't right. It is scary accurate now, a lot of times it really is. And that be, it's because of this crowdsource um, part of it and having experts behind the scenes going in and and identifying and agreeing with people's identification so like for me i'm a bird watcher and so i often go on to iNaturalist and look at other people's bird observations and say yes i agree that's what that was and so it raises the level of their observation and it tells the program that it's learned that this yes they were right and so it just keeps learning um, and it's a great tool one for yourself to help learn what you're seeing, and you don't have to carry 8,000 field guides with you all the time, um, particular, and also where it's really helpful is for plants, uh, because plants can be really hard to identify, and it's pretty good at identification in plants. And like this picture shows here on the left-hand side with the sunglasses for scale, these one, two, three, four, five, six, seven species are all in this little tiny picture right near these sunglasses. And this, this quote is true. We can't protect and manage what we don't know. Um, and so using iNaturalist is a way of helping us understand what's actually out there. But it is not just plants. As you can see from the picture on the right, it's insects, it's, it's birds, it's um, mushrooms, it's all kinds of stuff that you can put in here. Basically, it just has to be alive. Well, it has to be alive at some point. You can actually put dead things in um, and it will identify them. Um, and that's fine because sometimes that may be the only way we know something is there. Um, a colleague of, from another organization of mine actually found a dead porcupine in his yard in Philadelphia, um, which was really weird um, and totally unexpected, but really, really hard to not identify properly. Um, that it was a porcupine. And so even though it was dead, he could put it in iNaturalist and document that it was there. Um, so that's kind of cool. I'm not going to go into any detail about how to use the program. Um, in the interest of time, that can be a pre it, it is a presentation in and of itself. So if that is something that you are particularly interested in learning more about, um, there's a ton of information that iNaturalist has on their website about how to set up your account, all that kind of stuff, how to use it, what it all means. But if you want the more personal approach and would be interested in a program like this, specifically on iNaturalist, let me know either in the comments or shoot me an email afterwards and we'll look at getting it on the schedule um, in terms of doing a program like this or you know, ideally maybe at some point in person um, if we can. So. But why this is really important is because iNaturalist has what we call pro what they call projects. Um, and projects just help summarize observations that people make. Project creators set them up and they set up the criteria for what observations get included in a various project. Some projects actually require that you go sign up for them to be a part of, and a lot of them just run in the background. So you don't even know they're there. Um, until you make an observation and then you'll get a notification that says um, that this observation got added to this project. And sometimes your observation might get added to more than one project. So if, for example, I have projects running that are geographically based. So if you go on our Crossways Preserve and you put in a monarch butterfly picture and make that as an observation, it's going to get sucked into my project for crossways but it's also going to get sucked into north america butterfly project um, and and you will just get an announcement you know notification most likely in your email that says that happened and it'll show up on your on your observation record um, in your account that it's in those projects and so i have projects set up in the background you don't have to do anything to be a part of all you have to do is put in an observation on our properties or in the boundaries of the watershed. And I will be able to see that. 
And so this is a summary of the observations that have been made using iNaturalist at Crossways Preserve. So we have a total of 201 observations, 139 different species, 14 different observers have made those. Um, iNaturalist categorizes things as either needing identification or once, once that crowdsourcing piece of it happens, then they move to research grade, which is where we want to try to get all the observations to. Um, so we have about a 50-50 split now of things that need identification and things that are already research grade. Um, they break down the 139 species into all these different um, orders. And then um, looking at you know who's doing the identifications um, and helping out from that perspective. So these are running in the background. These are things that I scour uh, yearly, um, half yearly, to kind of see what's out there and get a sense and use that in my year-end summaries of what's around. I would like this 201 observations to go up five times. Um, I want to blanket the area with iNaturalist observations so that it can really help us understand what's out there. Um, and I will say as well, it's not a one and done kind of thing. It's really helpful um, if you see milkweed at crossways to put the milkweed in at crossways. But it's also helpful to put the milkweed in at Armand Trout. Um, so just because you already have, you have identified milkweed, um, it's helpful to identify it at other locations. It's also helpful to observe it at different points in time. So over the course of a season, it's helpful to know that this is when the flowers are starting. This is when the flowers are dead. This is when the seed pods are opening. And you can document that through pictures. You can add comments to your observations. Um, so things like that. So that time course of things and when you're seeing things is also really important. So you don't just have to do it once and be done with it you can make it an ongoing kind of a project. Um, and that's all I'm gonna say about iNaturalist. But like I said, let me know if it's something you are interested in more detail about. Um, and I'm happy to figure out if we can add, I'm sure we probably can add a webinar uh, to do something like this, to learn a little bit more about it um, and go into more detail. The other thing that I just wanted to plug really quickly before we wrap up with the last set of questions is um, we're starting sort of an ask an expert kind of program. Um, so specifically for wildlife, um, you can email your questions to this email address um, by July 17th. And then I'm gonna be going through all of them and answering as many as I can in a 15 minute video that we'll post on our website and on our social media channels. Um, so if there was a particular question about a particular species that I didn't get to tonight, obviously you saw from our, our surveys, there are a load of species in this area. Um, I, so I may go back, for example, the bee question that I couldn't answer. I may go back and try to get that uh, answered for um, this uh, video event. So, uh, but if there's other specific questions that you have about species in our area, feel free to participate in this. And I can't guarantee I'm gonna answer your question because I'm only gonna have 15 minutes, but I'm gonna do the best I can to um, get those questions answered. We are gonna do other topics. So land is actually the first one. So questions that you might have about how we run our conservation programs and some of the conservation work we do on our land and the properties that we manage. Um, those questions are actually due by tomorrow. Um, and then that video will be up um, probably next week sometime. Um, and then water is the next one and those questions are due by July 3rd. Um, we will be sending out more information via our emails. You may have already seen this. Uh, if you look on our social media channels as well, there's kind of the specifics of how to submit your questions um, as well. You know, you can send them to this email address. You can put them in the comments section uh, on uh, social media like um, Facebook and things like that as well. So. Again, keep that in mind if there's specific questions I didn't get to tonight about specific wildlife things, um, feel free to uh, put them through here and I will try to get them answered. So I'm gonna wrap up here with the last set of questions. I saw some comments popping up here in the chat. So let's see if there's any more. Okay, got some things about iNaturalist, yep. Um, so. Okay, great, no more very specific questions here. So 
I'm going to wrap up. Um, feel free, like I said, to submit questions. Uh, reach out to me uh, via email as well. Um, I'm happy to try to answer your questions that way. So I thank you all for joining us tonight. I hope you got uh, something out of this and learned a little bit about some of the wildlife that we have in the area and the ways that it is all connected and important. Um, and thanks again. I uh, really appreciate it. Have a good evening, everyone.